Yeah. Well, hey, everyone. We're glad that all of you are with us. I'm excited that you're here because we are starting a brand new series that Brooklyn has been working on for a few months. We're starting a series that we believe can really transform your life. Like, we really believe this. We put a lot of energy, a lot of time, a lot of prayer, a lot of thinking, a lot of studying, and a lot of thinking about all of you. The name of the series is simple. It's called Human. Just simply human. The reason why we're calling it human is because human is something that all of us have in common. I know that some of you wish that you could be a lion or that you could be a dolphin or some of you might wish you could be a cat and some of you act like a bear on occasion. But the reality is you're human and you're going to stay that way. So through this series, what I want to do is I want to talk to you about you becoming the human, the person that you're created to be. I want to talk to you about you becoming the person that God created you to be. Because most of the time what, what happens is, is we think that we're being true to ourselves. We think we're being true to ourselves when in reality what's happening is that we've taken on an identity of an imposter. We call it the false self. We also refer to it as what sin convinces you to be. Now I believe that all of us in this room, that's not the person that, that we want to be. It's not the person that God uh, create us to be, and, and here's the problem. The problem is that your true, your whole self has become fractured. Sort of like when you break a bone. Anybody ever broke a bone before? You've broken some bones? Strong people in the room or clumsy people in the room. I'm not sure which one it is. But when I was in the eighth grade, I had one goal when I joined the track team. Just one goal when I was in the eighth grade. I wanted to break the record for the mile. I wanted to break the record for the mile for my school and for the entire league. Like, I knew I could do it because in the seventh grade, I was a pretty good runner. Uh, my dad was a runner when I was growing up, and so I would just chase him. <laughs> That's what you do when you're young. It's funny, this week, uh, Brooklyn, or Brooklyn ran a half marathon at Disney. Should get up for her for that, even though she's not here. Uh, and Joey and I uh, ran a full marathon, and so my kids were over there, and they watched us run, all the excitement at Disney, and my youngest said, Daddy, I want to do that someday. I'm like, you don't have to wait until someday. Let's start now. And so we came home from the Disney Marathon, and she said, Daddy, when can we start? And I'm like, well, I need to heal a little bit. And my body's getting older. I'm past 40 years old now. I need to make sure I take care of myself. And she's like, okay, Daddy, I'll wait. The next day came. She's like, Daddy, is today the day we can start? I'm like, all right, Maya, I'll start with you. And so we started low, which is one mile. And every day I've been running with my nine-year-old Maya one mile. And she's like, Dad, how many days should we do this a week? And I'm like, well... I don't know, what do you think? Hoping she would say two or three. She said six. <laughs> well, let's just start with five, all right? Let's just go with uh, something manageable. But, you know, the, where we are in our lives is, is we have these things that we want to do, these, these things that we want to accomplish. And in the eighth grade, I just wanted to break the record. Because in the seventh grade, I ran the mile the entire year, and my fastest time in the seventh grade was a 5.01. Five minutes and one second in the seventh grade. If you don't know how fast a fast mile is, that's pretty fast for a seventh grade. Not bragging or anything, but actually I kind of am. I ran a 501 in the seventh grade, and the record was 457. I was four seconds away. And I knew from the seventh grade to the eighth grade that I had eaten enough Wheaties and drank enough chocolate milk. I didn't like white milk. I had I gotten myself prepared. And so before the track season started, we ended basketball season. And right after basketball season, we had an open gym. And what do you think happened at open gym? Broke my ankle. Broke my ankle. I had this dream. I'm going to break this. You only get one chance, Doug, one chance to break an eighth grade record. You don't get another chance unless you fail. And I was not planning on failing. I wanted to break this record so bad, and I broke my ankle. I jumped up to get a ball that had bounced really high, and I came down, and I landed on somebody else's foot. You ever felt that pain before? That is horrible pain. It's like the worst, and you think to yourself, it can't be broken. Then you go to the doctor, and it's broken. It was fractured. You know, a fracture hurts. It hurts. It causes pain. And it actually keeps you from doing what you can do when you're healthy. It causes you to live in fear. And that's sort of what, uh, what sin has done to us. That's sort of what sin has done to us. It has fractured who we are. It has fractured our identity. 
It has taken who you are and it's broken it. It's fractured your mind. It's fractured your head, which is how you think. It's, it's fractured your heart, which is how you feel. It's fractured your body, which is how you act. What it's done is it's fractured it and it's separated you from the person that God created you to be. Isn't that tragic? Isn't it tragic that in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, everything was good and perfect and then sin entered the world and it fractured us? It fractured us. And ever since that day, we walk around fractured, separated from who God created us to be. And I want to get back to that. Anybody else? I want to get back to the person that God created me to be. Like, I am desperate for it. I want it. And so that's what we're going to talk about in this series that we've created. I don't know about any of you, but uh, I'm not sure that I'm ready for self-driving cars. Anybody else? I'm not quite ready for self-driving cars. I think it's a good idea when I start to think about driving to Orlando and I could possibly take a nap and not have to worry about crashing. Like, that's kind of a good idea. Well, some people talk about what it's like when you're fractured in, your, in yourself, like separated from the person God created you to be, and, and, and they describe it as you living on autopilot, as if you had a self-driving car for the inside of who you are. Have you researched self-driving cars at all? Did you know they're actually on the road? No, I didn't know that. I was like, what? There's actually self-driving cars on the road. They're testing self-driving cars on the roads that you drive on, by the way. There are people sitting behind a steering wheel that they are not touching, and they're letting the car just drive itself. Now, something else I found out about self-driving cars I didn't know. Did you realize that multiple self-driving cars have crashed? You all must research more than I do, because I did not know there were self-driving cars on the road and that people were in them, and that they had crashed. Did you know this? Did you know that self-driving cars are not only on the road, but they're being driven with people in them, and that people have died after the crash? Did you know that? People have died riding on autopilot. So I did the research. I was curious. I want to know, like, why did the car crash? Because if someday we're all forced to ride in Jetson cars that drive themselves, then I want to know what I'm getting into. And so I read into it, and what the article told me was the one person who was riding in a self-driving car that crashed and then lost their life, the problem wasn't with the car, they're saying, obviously. The problem was with the person in the car. What they said was, even though it's a self-driving car and it's on autopilot, you're still responsible as the one sitting behind the wheel to be conscious and aware and pay attention to, paying attention to what happens so that if something goes bad, you can grab the steering wheel. Think about that in your own life. If we have truly been separated by sin from the person that God has created us to be, like we've been fractured, and now you're living on autopilot, what happens if you never take the responsibility of the wheel in your life. I don't want any of you to be the kind of person who just rides your life on autopilot, whether you're a believer in Jesus or not. I want you to be the kind of people who sit behind the wheel and when the time is right and when it requires it, you're able to take the wheel so that you don't crash and destroy the everything that God has given you. And what I'm here to tell you tonight is that through Jesus, transformation is possible for you. Transformation is possible for you through Jesus. And what I mean by that is God wants to help you take the steering wheel so that you don't crash and burn and destroy your life. Because maybe for you, your true self is meant to rest in serenity, but you are restless in anger. Maybe your true self is meant to rest in authenticity, but you are restless in vanity. Maybe your true self is meant to rest in courage, but you're restless in fear. Maybe your true self is meant to rest in sobriety, but you are restless in gluttony. It really doesn't matter. Whatever it is, this is what God wants for you. God wants you to be a pro at being who God created you to be. Because your relationship depends on it. Because your job depends on it. Because your education depends on it. Because your emotional health depends on it. Because your family depends on it. 
Because your finances depend on it. Because your future depends on it. And I know some of you tonight, you need to hear this. You can blame sin because it's happened, or you can take responsibility. I think it's time to take responsibility. And so what I'm going to do throughout this series is each week, I'm going to talk to you about how to take responsibility. Each week, I'm going to tell you how you personally in your life can get back to where you're meant to be, your true self, the, the self that God made when you were formed in your mother's womb. Like, I want to get you back there, but you have to be able to say, I'll take responsibility. Like, Jesus came and walked on this earth and gave up his life and died on the cross and offers you forgiveness. But there's a step that you have to take, and that step that you have to take is taking responsibility. We can't be the kind of people that said, that happened to me back then. My mom and dad, they did that to me back then, and that is awful. My friends, they did that to me back then, and that was bad. My boss did that to me back then, and that wasn't right. All those things are not things that should be happening to you, but at this point in your life, you can't change anything except for what you do in the future, and that means taking responsibility. So what I want to do is I want to use a verse as an anchor um, for this entire series. Just one verse. It comes to us from the Apostle Paul. It's found in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. This is what Paul said. Paul said, and all of us, all of us, with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image. I think about what it's talking about. All of us, with unveiled faces, meaning there's nothing standing between our face and the reflection that's about to come back on us. When our unveiled faces, what's ever covering our faces, in other words, when the, when the mask is taken off, and then we can see the glory of God as though reflected in a, in a mirror, we look for ourselves, and what we see is Jesus. It's then that we're being transformed into that image. Isn't that good news? To me, that's good news. So something else I want to do is I want to, to use an ancient tool of spiritual formation over the next nine weeks. It's called the tradition of the Enneagram. The tradition of the Enneagram is a tool that pastors and spiritual leaders have been using for generations. And what it does is it it describes nine different personality types, nine different personality types, one of which will sound a whole lot like you. It will sound a whole lot like you. And so something else I want to do is I'm going to look at nine different Bible characters that match one of the nine different personality types that we're talking about. And so here's what I want you to do throughout this series. I want you to do this. I want you to identify what is your personality type according to the Enneagram because I think it's really going to help you. The second thing I want you to do is I want you to learn from a Bible character. And then the third thing I want you to do is I want you to take responsibility. Take responsibility for your journey home. Because God is saying, come home to who I meant you to always be. Are you ready? You don't sound very ready. Somebody's ready. All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to start with one number tonight. We're going to start with a number eight. Now, some of you have already done this. You've looked at who you think you might be. But what we're going to do is we're going to give you a description. And through this description, we want you to think about, is this me? <laughs> now, what we don't want you to do during, the, during this series is to think about the person next to you. <laughs> you're going to be tempted to do it because you're going to hear some things and you're going to be like, yeah, that's that person right there next to me especially the bad stuff. You're going to be like, yep, that was my mom. That's my mom. Yep, that's definitely my mom. Or you're going to be like, yep, that's my daughter, man. My daughter, I wish she could have learned this like five years ago before we got in this mess. So that's not what this is for. This is for you to look at yourself and say, is this me? Because if it's you, then you have a chance to know how to be the best version of you. We'll start with number eight. Number eights are awesome. Any number eights in the room that know you're number eight? JJ, are you here? If you are, you're hiding and you're not raising your hand. There you are. JJ was on the screen. He is a number eight. They are awesome because of these reasons. They're awesome because they're confident. If you know someone in their life or if you're someone who's confident, chances are you might be an eight. They are confident. 
They're awesome because they're fearless and strong. They're awesome because, listen to this, they love to do what others say can't be done. Got to have someone like that in your life. They're awesome because they're honest, straight-talking people who are not afraid to go nose-to-nose with whatever life brings them. They're awesome because they care deeply about justice and fairness. Now, the problem is when type 8s are unhealthy, or as Brooklyn likes to say, riding on the struggle bus... Here's how eights can be. They can be steamrollers. They can start an argument in an empty room. Don't bump the person next to you right now like, that's you. In their mind, they have opinions. Or in their mind, you have opinions, and they have facts. They have little patience for people who are indecisive or don't pull their weight. And listen, people, they can come across as bossy or another B word that you might be familiar with, if you know what I'm talking about. You know, at their worst, eights are constantly thinking to themselves, I don't want to be controlled. I don't want to be controlled. If you're someone who says that to yourself or says that to someone you love, I just don't want to be controlled. Maybe this message is for you. I just don't want to be controlled, and I'm not about to put myself in a position to be vulnerable to it, so here's what I'll do. I'll just take control. I'll take control of the situation, because if I'm in control, then I don't have to be in submission to anybody else. Now, when eights are at their best, this is what they're like. When eights are at their best, they can release control. They can let go of control, and what that means for them is they can actually find themselves having the ability to trust themselves with others. They could do it. Now, after I read that description, does anybody in the room believe they might be a type 8 on the Enneagram? Raise your hands tall and high. Let me see. You've got one little, we've got, got a grade schooler who believes that he is a challenger. Well, some of you, you might be saying in your heart, that's me. Yeah, that's me. So who in the Bible might be a type 8? Anybody have any ideas? <laughs> We believe, Paul is one of them, we like to go with Miriam. Now, Miriam's story comes to us from the Old Testament. Uh, Most of you don't even know who Miriam is, do you? Miriam's story comes to us from the Old Testament. Uh, Miriam is the sister of Moses, the Moses who parted the Red Sea. Anybody know that before I said that? You knew that she was, don't lie to me. You did not know she was the sister of Moses. She was the sister of Moses, and she was the type of leader, get this, the type of leader who probably didn't get the credit she deserves. She didn't get the credit. Because when she grew up, she became a prophetess, a prophetess. You didn't know there was such a thing. You just thought there were prophets. There were prophetesses, (laughs) women who prophesied. And she was one of them. She was also the very first choir director talked about in the Bible. Give me a hallelujah on that, right? (laughs) It was a woman singing those choirs and getting them started and having them shout at the top of their lungs, we love Jesus. She was also one of the only three people, listen, one of the only three people that God chose to rescue God's people from being slaves in Egypt. One of only three people. You just thought it was Moses. It was three people. It was Moses, it was Aaron, and it was Miriam. And none of you know her name. You maybe heard it before. But you don't know what she did. And you don't know how important she was. And guess what? That hurts, doesn't it? That hurts. When you've done something important and nobody recognizes you, especially if you're an eight, That hurts really, really bad. And so if you're someone like Miriam, most likely this is what you would have said, especially if you're a woman. You might say this, what? Is it because I'm a woman? Because that's sexist. That's what an eight would say. It's because I'm a woman? That's sexist. Or an eight would say this, if you were Miriam. You would say this. You would say, you know what? I gave all to what I was doing, and they like gave half of what they had. 
Or you might even say this if you were Miriam. You know what? How many different times was Moses indecisive? If you know the story, you know what I'm talking about. How many different times was Moses indecisive? Oh, God, I, can't, I don't know if I can do this, God. I know you called me, and I'm the right person, and I'm in the right circumstances, but, God, I can't even speak. Like, I can't even make sense. Like, I, I, nobody's going to listen to me. I'm not strong enough. They're going to kill me. How many different times was Moses indecisive? But what Miriam would say, or what you would say, if you were Miriam, is ever. Every single time I made decisions fast and from the gut, give me some credit. And some of you, you get there. Some of you, you, you're like Miriam when you're an eight and you're living in this space where you feel like you've been hurt and you know you've been fractured and you have this pain. You've done this before. You've thought to yourself, something isn't right, at least according to your eyes. And so what you do is you slam down your fist or you shoot off with your mouth. That's, that's probably the most popular. Just say whatever you want to say, whether it hurts someone or not. Or you just become unrelentingly critical of everyone. Just criticizing everyone. Like, they're not good. They're horrible. They don't know what they're talking about. They haven't given enough effort. They're ugly. They stink. I can't stand them. All they do is complain. All they do is sit around on their bottoms and do nothing. Like you just start criticizing every possible circumstance that you can do it. And you know what that's doing? That's just only self-sabotaging. Because what happens to you if you're an eight and you're doing what I'm talking about is in relationships, what happens is trust is gone. It's gone. Trust is gone. You are not going to say you're sorry. There are some of you in the room right now who you can't remember the last time you said those words. I'm sorry. I was talking to a teenager this week, and and I said, when's the last time you remember your mom and dad saying, I'm sorry? And they said, never. Now, moms and dads, I, I like to believe that as adults that we are responsible human beings and we don't make as many mistakes as our kids, but you're not perfect. And there will be days in your life when you had to look your child in the eye and say to them, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, son. I'm sorry, daughter. But instead, if you're this kind of person where this is who you are, what ends up happening is you just push and you push and you push until you eventually push the person away. Now, that's in relationships. But think about it work at work. What happens at work and at school is you challenge and you question authority. <laughs> You're the person on the team who never does what the coach's coach says. And if the coach tells you to do it and you do it, you do it begrudgingly. And everybody sees it on your face. They can tell that you do not like your coach. And then when you get away from your coach, what you end up doing is complaining about your, about your coach. They don't know what they're talking about. They won't play me when I know I'm the best person in this position. They don't understand me. Like They don't get my feelings. They didn't listen to me. They don't come and they don't talk to me and they don't spend time with me. And so all we do is we just start criticizing whoever's in charge, whoever our leader is. And what ends up happening is we stand our ground until we get fired or kicked off the team or we quit. That's bad news, isn't it? But that's what the imposter looks like in your life. That's what the false you looks like in your life. And God wants to get you to your true self. Here's what happened to Miriam. (laughs) If you don't know the story, suddenly God calls Miriam into a meeting with Aaron and Moses into the tent. And God says to her, why, Miriam? Why are you not afraid to speak against Moses? Because what she ended up doing was Back in book, the book of Numbers, chapter 12, verse 1, she went to the place where the intensity got so hot and she became so aggressive that with fiery passion, she said, Moses doesn't deserve it. Moses is a failure. She starts with saying this, he married a foreigner. Now, you're like, what in the heck? Like, we live in America. It's okay. Like, we don't talk about that anymore. 
but you're talking about the people of God who were trying to remain pure. It wasn't okay to marry someone outside of your people. And, and he goes and he marries someone. And so she begins to criticize Moses saying he did it. He did something wrong. He married a foreigner. And then she puts her foot down and she stands up for herself. And she says in the book of Numbers chapter 12, verse 1, this is what she says. She says, you know what? Moses isn't the only one that God used to speak to the people. God also spoke through us. And by us, she spoke, she's speaking about Aaron and herself. So here we are, and all of a sudden, God calls her into a meeting with Aaron and Moses. And God says to her, why are you not afraid to speak against Moses? And immediately, it tells us that Miriam turned white as snow. White as snow. The color flooded from her skin. You ever seen someone in that situation before? Last week, I had my stitches out. I about lost my finger on, on New Year's Day when a grill lid fell on my finger. It was horrible. It was painful. It was awful. I was so happy to have my finger, but I had stitches. And then somebody here at the church who's a nurse is grateful enough to take out the stitches. Whew, it hurt. I've had stitches in my life many times, on my chin four different times in the same spot. You would think I would learn not to do the same thing over and over and over again. I've had stitches on my head twice, on the top of my head. One time I jumped into the pool and hit somebody else's head and it cut me open. The second time I was surfing and this big board hit me on top of the head and it cut me open. And now here's my finger and last week I'm asking the person here at the church to take the stitches out of my finger and it hurts, people. Sometimes it hurts. I'm normally the tough guy, but in this situation it hurts. And what began to happen, it's like my body went into this shock, and I began to sweat when it wasn't hot in the room. You ever been there? I started to sweat. Like, why am I sweating right now? It's not hot in this room. And then people looked at me like, Coy, are you okay? And I was like, why? They said, because your face looks like a ghost. Like, all the blood has left your face. Are, are you going to be able to be okay? Are you going to pass out? And then they started making fun of me, by the way, after that. They didn't take care of me. They made fun of me, all you people in this room. It's going to get you back someday. Don't you worry about that. But that's what happened to Miriam. She finds out this bad news, and she goes pale, pale white. The reason why is because Miriam, like most eights, she picked up on something. And what she picked up on is this message that no one can be trusted, only the strong survive, I have to take control and fight for what I think is right. And this false sense of self that she believed became her deadly sin. Do you know that all of us have a deadly sin? All of us have a deadly sin. It's dependent upon your personality, but all of us have a deadly sin. And this was hers. Because then it tells us in the book of Numbers, chapter 12, verse 8, that she looked like a stillborn baby. Nobody likes to imagine a stillborn baby. One of the worst images, right? Man, who, who, wants to, who wants to think about that? A life that has come into this world yet has no life. And that's the description of Miriam once she'd gotten so far into this person who she's really not, but who she's come to believe that she is. She's just a shell of a human being a long way from the person that God created her to be. And some of you are there right now. Some of you have gotten to the place where you don't know who you are anymore. And the person that you think you are is not the person that God created you to be. But listen to this. Because the next thing that happens is that Moses cries out to God, God, Please heal her. The one that she had spoken against cries out to God, God, please heal her. Now, if you're here and you think that you're a type 8 personality and you've been tricked into being your false self, chances are someone is praying for you. Trust me. Someone is praying for you. Chances are a parent is praying for you. Oh, God, please heal my child. Chances are a child is praying for you. Oh God, please heal my mommy or my daddy. Chances are a friend or a group of friends are praying for you. Oh God, please heal my friend. Or chances are a leader, somebody that knows you well, is praying for you. Oh God, please heal her. I'm here to tell you today 
that there's hope, people, that there's hope. There is hope, and there's a way for you to find your way home to a real you, to the healthy you, to the person that you were created to be. And if you're this kind of person who has this kind of personality, the path is this. The path is to let your weakness become your strength. To let your weakness become your strength. Paul, the apostle, said it himself, didn't he? He said, when I am weak, then I am what? I am strong. Because Paul knew that in his weakness that he grows connected to the one who has limitless strength. Limitless strength, unlimited. So listen to me, eights. When, you, when, you, when the veil of your false self is removed and you are able to see who you truly are, then, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, then you are being transformed into a person who reflects the perfect human and his name is Jesus. And that's when you become someone who is a great friend, a cherished spouse, a loving father and mother, an exceptional leader, a champion for the weak. That's when you're able to say to others and do things that they say can't be done. And you can trust yourself with others at just the right time. I want some of you so bad to get to that person. To find your way home to the person that God has created you to be. As the band makes their way up here and we close out the service and and we allow ourselves to connect with God through song, I want you to think about this. In the Gospel of John, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said in the Gospel of John that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And do you know we've used that verse as a way to argue against other religions and prove that the Christian faith is the only way, and I believe that. But I want to use it in a different way. I want you to hear Jesus speaking to you in a different way tonight through this verse. Because what I think Jesus wants to say to you through these words is that you can trust you with me. That's what I believe that Jesus wants to say to those of you who know that you identify as this kind of personality, as someone who struggles with these things, as someone who has taken upon this false self, that Jesus wants you to hear these words, that you can trust you with me. You're safe with me. Because what I think Jesus is saying is, the only way to the Father is through me, which means you have to be vulnerable to my leadership. And then I'll take you there. Will you stand with me? Because what I want to do is I want to give you an opportunity to start your path to healing tonight. There's nine different personality types that we're looking at throughout this series. And the majority of you won't be the one we talked about tonight, but some of you are. And you've been living this lie and you've been messing up your relationships and you've been destroying your opportunity at work and you're messing up your own kid's future because you're making them a disciple who believes that you live according to the, the person that sin convinces you you are? Like, do you realize that as adults, when we have kids and we continue to stir up this part of ourself that really isn't who God created us to be, we're just stirring up a pot and we're making a, this, this thing of soup and we're feeding it to our kids and that's what nourishes their soul? That they get to grow up on this food that we're feeding them? And then they become somebody who has to fight with the same problems and the same imposter where they're riding on autopilot as adults. And then we look at them and we say, why is my child like this? Why is my child so crazy? And if you ask your child, your child might say, because mommy and daddy, you never found out who you were in Jesus. You only believed who you were according to how sin told you you were. And some of you tonight is the moment that you can start to find your way home home to your true self, the self that loves purely, the self that makes hope come alive, the self that is strong and courageous 
that does things that people say nobody else can do because you have the personality that says that you can do it, but you won't as long as you're sick and as long as you're fractured. And then Jesus comes along and says, let me heal you. You can trust you with me. You can trust you with me. Believe me, you can trust you with me. And here's why. Because I left heaven and I came to earth and my body was fractured and broken for you. And when I was on that cross and I looked out at the people who were shouting my name, making fun of me and mocking, saying that he's the king of the Jews, here's the words that Jesus says, I speak over you. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. And that's what this entire series is about, is that Jesus is looking at you and he knows that you don't always know what you do. And so he gives the invitation. Trust me. If you're a type 8 personality, Jesus says, trust me. Now, I believe everybody in the room should have a chance to trust Jesus. And so if you're here tonight and you want to start that journey to transformation, the person that God wants you to be, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Close your eyes. God, I'm here and I'm broken because for so long I've just lived on autopilot. I've been asleep and I had no idea who I truly was in you. And tonight I feel like there's a better version. I feel like you created me for more. And I want to be that healthy self. I want to be the one who is the best version of who I can be, but I know I can't get there if I can't trust because I'm the kind of person who takes control. I, I believe everybody's going to betray me because nobody is trustworthy, and I'm here, and I want to trust you. I want to follow you. I want to believe that you have my best interest in mind. Because God, someday I, I want to be the kind of person who, when I look in the mirror, the reflection that I see is the image of your love and the image of your grace and the image of your power and the image of your peace and the image of your grace and the image of your mercy and the image of the hope that you bring and the image of the future that you write and the image of a story that's redeeming and the image of a story that's sa saving and, and the image of a story that, that helps the world become a place where the kingdom of God is alive and well and strong and never gonna be defeated. So God, I, I wanna start following you tonight. I wanna trust myself with you. I trust me with you, Jesus. So forgive me. Forgive me for living the false self and show me the way to my true self. In your name we pray. Amen.